What a show this is gonna be today. Here's a question. My divorced daughter has lived with us now for three years and I'm ready for her to move out. Kathy, I don't even wanna know. <laughs> Stay tuned to find out what she doesn't wanna know, but you do. Hello and welcome to Sister to Sister. Boy, the sisters have lots to talk to you about today. So glad you're with us. And we are, if you've never seen us before, we are five intelligent, beautiful women of God. And we bring questions that you send us and we, we digest them and then give you our advice and word of God. The biblical perspective is where we come from. Except for, I'm not sure about this one. Listen, <laughs> my daughter divorced and then she moved in with us and it's been three years. She's still in our house. Ooh. Thank you for writing to us. Uh -huh. Am I wrong that it's time for her to go? Amy, what do you think? Well, um, First of all, I think it's great that, <laughs> I was just thinking, wow. I, I'm so happy that my daughter is out of the house. Not, <laughs> not for just me, but for her and for all of us. So <laughs> just, well. so I'm really glad that they were able to help the daughter. Three years and you're basically raising another family, you know? So I would say this, without a vision, people perish or just wander. Mm -hmm. I would say, get a plan immediately. Like, do, do we need to get her a car? Do we need to look for a small house, help her with a down payment? Um, just helping her to move forward, you know, independently with her and her family. It's her family, her life, her future. So this lady that's writing is not wrong in wanting her daughter to move on? Uh, no. Okay. No. no. Good. Yes. What do you have, Corey? Well, I have a perspective on this because we actually lived with our three children with my parents for a year and a half. It was a different circumstances. I wasn't divorced. It was with my husband. It was um, back when the real estate, uh, you know, crumble happened in 2008, and we had a home in another state that we couldn't sell for eight years. Wow. So my parents were very generous in allowing us to live with them. And for the first six months, it was bliss. Uh -huh. Everyone was so happy. <laughs> the grandkids were around. It was so great. And then the next six months, we're like, okay, it's getting a little old. And then the last six months, we're like, everybody was just like, oh, get out. Yeah, but exactly. I, right. I, I, I do need to say there needs to be communication. No one can read any anybody's minds. And so, no, this woman is not wrong for wanting her daughter to come up with a plan to move out and for the, this to be an end. But she cannot just assume that her daughter knows that or that her daughter is making a plan or that her daughter is, there needs to be communication. There really does. And I think that was something we learned in our situation was there was, there wasn't communication happening. And so there wasn't like, we didn't know what my parents were thinking. My parents didn't know what we were thinking. And so once we sat down and communicated about it, much more smooth sailing. Yeah. And so you need to have a plan of action. You need to communicate that. And it was, it was just so much better once that was in place. So we're telling you get a plan. What do you have, Roxy? Well, you know, the Psalms say, help me to proclaim your word to the next generation. Mm -hmm. What is your purpose there? Mm -hmm. Right. in your daughter's life and your mm -hmm. grand... Some cultures stay together their entire yeah, true. lives. Right. True. This is more of an American thing and I'm mm -hmm. not saying it's wrong or right. What are you called to do? And I have to say this, uh, my daughter and my granddaughter were with us while my uh, daughter was going through the nurse practitioner program and my mother watched my, my granddaughter. Okay, you know my mom. Yes. Her sweetness, her tenderness, her strength. My granddaughter has things in her. My mm -hmm. children have things in them. I didn't necessarily live with them, but you might as well say I did. I we was there all the time. We were there all the time. There are things that you need to proclaim to the next generation. Mm -hmm. yes. Stop worrying about all the little stuff. Like our sister says, plan, work together, communicate. But don't worry about the little stuff. My mother knew she had a purpose in my granddaughter's life. 
So she oh. poured into your granddaughter. Yes. So beautiful. It is so beautiful. beautiful. It, it, was it hard? Yes. Mm -hmm. 10, 12 hours, she's worked, she's at school, my daughter. It worked out because my mm -hmm. mother's attitude. Well, while I have you, well, yes. can, I, can, I, can I jump oh, of in course. please sure. real quick? Because I do believe your piece about the culture is so important. I think because we're so westernized, there are just things that we don't even think about. We right. see it as an inconvenience when really generationally it's a blessing, right. you yes. know. Um, we were blessed mm -hmm. enough to live and have, like Timothy, to have his mother and mm -hmm. grandmother's faith poured That's into right. him. And so that is key. One of the things I just wanted to point it out is that in this question, we are talking about specifically a divorcee. Mm. Divorce is very traumatic. It is very volatile to the soul. And so I would encourage the mother, because this isn't the normal circumstances. This isn't me returning back home. Right, right. This isn't me, you know, I, I am experiencing a, a, a death from what I've been told. By the grace of God, I haven't been divorced. Not that I didn't, never thought about it. But, um, you know, it's so volatile to the soul the trauma that's there, you know, and I would encourage the mother to consider how am I to be an instrument in this person's healing, in this child's healing, male or female, it doesn't matter. Um, and I think it's so easy when people, even if the sacrifice is my space is being crowded, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. um, obedience is better than sacrifice. So I, I think that it's, it's, it's a key element to just take into consideration we are talking about somebody that's divorce. They didn't return home right. um, on a happy Thank occasion. You. Yeah. You Thank know? you for, for uh, because we're always mm -hmm. thinking about you who are watching us. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. the um, thing about the gal's divorce mm -hmm. does definitely make a difference. Mm -hmm. Thank Sorry. you, Flo. But mm -hmm. I am going to go to the next question. Okay. Um, I'm coming to you, Roxy, because you have lots of kids, but I don't know if this ever happened to you. My adult <laughs> son isolated himself. I understand that he has no Christians to fellowship with where he is, but I think he is really hard of a judge on people. So you're judging your son, but that's okay. He doesn't understand uh, his need for community. How do I help him? Is it my place to help him and tell him? I'm not sure this person really understands their son. Perhaps, right. perhaps. There are people with different personalities mm -hmm. that it's not you, mom, to mm -hmm. take that place to bring them into community. Mm -hmm. You know, the, you could say scripture, he who isolates himself is as his own ruin, mm -hmm. all that sort of thing. You don't know who his friends are. Mm -hmm. His friends and relationships may be his work. His friends and relationships may be the charitable things he does. He doesn't live in community. And this is my problem with some of the Christian community as I was growing up and maturing in a way. They want us to fit into the culture. If I fit into the culture in the 70s and 80s, I might not have been a lawyer in all the things <laughs> I got to do. Right. Because my culture was an ethnic culture. My culture was, you know, your husband's career, whatever, you enhance that. We were enhancing one another. So I need to tell this mom, maybe he's protecting himself yes. from bad morals. Maybe he's protecting from himself, knowing what's out there. Allow him those little steps to form relationships. And it might even be with your husband, who may or may not be the same personality. Form those few relationships because his personality can't take. Well, the question all too is, is, is this my place? So is it the mother's job, Amy? I, I, I agree. And then I have another thought that... I'm not sure anybody knows your child like the mother does. I mean, you were with them in the That's day true. and the night and That's the true. seasons. And so you know when it's getting to like a dangerous point where he's alone. And I, I can't, I'm not his sole person to be there with him. He needs a community. And I mean, that's from a pastor's heart. You need a church and you need a place where people are caring about you and thinking about you and building friendships and growing together with God. I mean, even in the scripture, Jesus says, as you see these days coming upon you, grow more and more together. But how is the mom supposed to do that? It's I don't him. Know it's that it is the mom's re re responsibility. Right. I think what the mother may need to know is that perhaps. Here's another perspective. Perhaps she's done such a tremendous job that the child is so secure, they don't Maybe. feel the need to go outside and build that. 
the way that she's thinking it should reflect. For example, we grew up a very close-knit family. I, I, when I was raising my children, I couldn't relate to not fitting in or having to have a best friend or having, because my best yeah. friends were my cousins. We hung right. out with them. Yes. We did that. So I could not make the connection. So it seemed very different to me to watch them yeah. uh, go through yeah. it. Um, yeah. the, the other thing is that, you know, um, sometimes our, later on in life, we discover that maybe our children are on the autism spectrum or have a little, you know, something else going on that causes them to disconnect. Uh, and then I, I so love the point that you brought forward. When you've done a good job in raising them up and they are determined to walk like that, they do become very discerning. It's like, mm, you can affect my morals, so I don't wanna really hang out with you over mm -hmm. here. I like you, I can do yeah. my, you can be a good study mm -hmm. partner for me, but you're not someone I want to have in, uh, to be in a, in a, in a close uh, circle with me. Right. What, what do you I have, think Cora? also, what kind of example is he seeing from you? Like, you might be like, oh, he needs community so bad, but like, do you have a community? Or do you mm. literally just like, mm only go to church and right. then like only like you've only ever taken care of your kids right. like what kind of example right. have right. you set for your kids a lot of times you know you've invested so much in your kids and that's all they ever saw they never saw you like mm -hmm. going out and like having yes, friendships right. or like they never saw that example and so you have to reflect on yourself and for say sure. what kind of community did you build that they saw that example from you. Or did they I have think, so yeah. much that the, it, for them right now, it's kind of like, let me unplug and re, you know or what I mean? Opposite. Like, let me, yeah. yeah. And there's yeah. seasons in children's exactly. life. Mm -hmm. You know, he might be studying hard, working hard to be the best that he could be. When I was going to law school, I was in that yeah. room, mm -hmm. New Year's right. Eve, mm -hmm. Christmas Eve. Right. You know, I had a goal and I was working toward that goal. And then there was a release in another season mm -hmm. in my life when I can be in community. Right, right. When it's interesting. Are so yeah. sociable, especially in church. You know, you don't get to say, I don't want to do, I don't want to go. I want, like, I am mm -hmm. some, I'm, I'm an introvert. You know what I mean? Um, but when you're coming up, you don't get to say, I don't want to go over Cousin Corey's. I don't want to go over Aunt yeah. Roxanne. Right. Well, right. now I'm grown yeah. and I don't want to go. Right. <laughs> you know? But so. I want you to answer this. I do, okay. do want to have time mm -hmm. for this question for Flo, because mm -hmm. I think you can do this. It's a long question. You wrote, my friend vents to me about her husband all the time. Time. It's becoming too much. She doesn't want to listen to how she might be playing a part in the issues. Hmm. When I try to tell her, I don't think you should be telling me all this, she goes on to say, I couldn't live without your help. You wrote this. I know friendships will be over if I say anything to her. My husband said I attract these kind of people. <laughs> I kind of do. Oh my God. What do you think about this? What do we tell this woman? There, there are so many different dynamics to this question. There's, I, there's I, a lot I, to I, unpack. Oh we, we, yeah, there's, there's, there's a lot to unpack here. So I, I'll make some attempts and you guys, you know, I'm sure we'll, we'll we jump in and her? cover what I, yes. what I don't. First of all, let's um, start with the fact that if your friend is calling you to vent, I'm not calling you for counsel. True. So can you please present complain. me with the right. minute, not even complain. Right. Honest confession is good for the soul. See, we take this thing too far. God made gospel so simple. We complicate it, mm. you know. I just need to vent. Why? Because the word of God says honest confession is good for the soul, right? So I need to get it out. I just need the ministry of presence from you at this time. Let me tell you, as I walk through this thing with my husband recently passing, sometimes when people come out of it, I know they mean well, and I don't mean it to be rude, but then they want to talk to you like you never knew God. They want to quote oh. scripture to you like you never, mm. like, you know, I get it, okay? Jesus is still on the throne. God is still God, but I'm grieving this situation yeah, right, right now. And this is what, what's happening with me right now, and I need you to hear me out. The other thing is if I'm going to offer counsel, I usually say to the person when I realize that or discern they're in a venting mode, do you want me to respond? Mm. Mm. And let them tell you, yeah, I do want to know what you think, you know? And then you need to be sitting up. Here's the other part. I got to be sensitive to what's happening to me. There are times, you know, Corey, Roxy, I'm just not in the place to hear what somebody yeah. had, you know? Right, and I right. just tell them up front, I'm not in a good space right yeah, now. I'm not this. the one you want to run that past. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? What do you have, girl? Somebody. 
I mean, I thought you were going to answer that question differently. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were going to be like, you got to be honest with them. And, like... and I, but I do feel that you're no, fine. No, I, I yeah. just think, <laughs> I, I do think it's like, is this a person that's like, like, constantly complaining about like their husband like like mm -hmm. the dripping faucet yeah, do you know yeah, what i right, mean right. like mm -hmm. oh my husband they never puts his socks in the the mm -hmm. thing and like you know like that kind of thing <laughs> i think it really depends on like i think this issue to me came across like they're just constantly complaining about their husband and it's like you're like look at like do some self-reflection like there's, it takes two to tango here, you know what I mean? Like, and I, I just looked at it like sort of a one-sided friendship type of situation. Okay. Okay. But I, I, you know, there's way more that we don't know right. about this right. situation. Right. Yeah. I, I hope that you got something from our two answers. And it reminds me of when I say to someone, hi, how are you? And then they tell me, that's rough. <laughs> she doesn't want to know. We'll be right back right after this. She don't even want to know. Welcome back. You're watching Sister to Sister. More conversation for you. You're going to like this question, maybe. You write, I grew up in a church where we talked a lot about not having sex before marriage and how bad it was, how wrong it was. Now I'm married. You write this. And you say, I find I'm having a hard time switching my brain to sex is good. Corey. Okay, well, welcome to pretty much every Christian that grew up in the 80s and the 90s. Right. I mean, this was the message, okay? Uh -huh. There was, you know, it just, it was just like, you don't talk about sex, and when you do talk about it, it's sex equals bad. Like, that was the message, you know? And I'm, like, I'll tell you, like, this is how I learned about sex, because you didn't talk about it in, in my household growing up. And I don't blame Mama and Dad Pearson, okay? Like, I don't blame them. It's just like, they didn't have the navigation tools for it either. The Dr. Dobson book was left in the oh. bathroom for me to read, oh, okay? okay? That's how I learned about what sex was because it, it just was a taboo subject, okay? So the only thing you ever heard was nothing or sex is bad. So that messes with you, that messes with you that messes with your sex life, that messes with, it, it, it just, it really does. And it, you have to kind of like work that out. It takes a lot of working out to kind of change your, you're just all of a sudden supposed to change your whole mindset now, because you're married and now like sex it equals good. Mm -hmm. Like it, it, it takes a lot to just flip that over on its side and to make this whole, dynamic change well, so I'm flipping over you have to you have to work that through and and like yeah. <laughs> it, it takes a lot of like talking it out counseling yes like I... talking it through with your a loving spouse it takes a lot of reading books it takes yeah. it's a lot yes what do you have Amy I love this subject <laughs> so much Bring it on. It, it's such a beautiful part of marriage. Yes. And it's also a it's very, a gift. it's a gift. And it, there's, it, there's also seasons. There's also um, issues. And there's times where, you know, you're going through stuff personally. Yeah. I mean, it has to be this thing. It's, it's a beautiful dance of giving grace and, yes. and serving and being selfless and, but I think it is important to realize that it is a gift from God. It is supernatural. It's for your enjoyment and it is God designed. So I would say to all the married couples who are feeling like I'm embarrassed. I mean, I was really modest. I mean, I think about how yeah. mo I would just, you know, like I was in the same teaching, you know, kiss, dating, goodbye, don't have sex before marriage. And we didn't. I mean, we were, we went by the rules, but now you're in this marriage where there's just all this freedom. And I would say to my younger self, man, be free, enjoy it in a healthy way, yeah. go crazy. Okay, well, all I can say is Corey said, if you grew up in the 80s and 90s, and I say to you out there, <laughs> if you grew up in the 70s. 70s. <laughs> okay, we just had Woodstock, and that's the only thing I'm saying about S-E-X. That's it. 
The marriage okay. bed this is, is what not defiled. I have to say about sex and church and this question, okay? <laughs> Correct, you know, I mean, what you guys both said is great. But I also grew up in a time where, you know, I remember Linda, our beautiful makeup artist, her grandmother's name was Dr. Elma Ellery, well, great grandmother. And I remember, she was like a second grandmother to me, and I remember uh, Dr. Ellery saying to me, don't you never touch a boy, and don't you never let a boy touch you. <laughs> And I thought, I'm in a whole lot of trouble because I got brothers over there and we fighting and going at it yeah. all the yeah. time. They're touching me. What are you talking about? So then you get saved, mm -hmm. you give your life to the Lord and you're growing up and you're, you're being taught that, you know, sex is bad. It's only for marriage, which I agree. And, you know, all of that. But sex is not bad. That's that part that we didn't have a lot of clarity on. I think they were trying to scare us straight, so to speak. <laughs> so... T.D. Jakes shares this story about, um, you know, a mother in the Lord and how they had put her up to speak to the younger women, let the older teach the younger. They put this mother up to speak to the <laughs> younger woman. And, and she says, um, in all my years, my husband has never seen me naked. <laughs> and I agree with T.D. My God, mother, that's what killed him. <laughs> so for that result... <laughs> And for that reason, <laughs> I don't give granny panty showers. Okay. I don't believe in them. <laughs> granny I, panty showers? Yeah, what you know how you old, the old holiness sanctified folk want to pretend like they don't, you know, you want to wrap them up in a, in a, Hello, that's in a potato sack. <laughs> Victoria should not have all them secrets. You need to know some. <laughs> you need your own secrets. You need to know some. There you go. So, you know, um, <laughs> But really, when, when a child has been taught and then all of a sudden they say, I do, and then the light goes on and you're like, so what am I supposed to do? So we have had to do some practical things, yeah. seriously. Some of my daughters in the Lord, you know, those who successfully were able to keep themselves, maybe need a book, right. maybe need a serious mm -hmm. talk. Mm -hmm. um, and then the communication, one of you said that, the yes. communication between yeah. husband and wife, you know. But it's hard. How do I tell you how to satisfy me when I don't even know what I'm doing yeah you know right. and and if you've kept your eye gate clear you know and your ear gate clear that can be a wrestle so I think we as the church have to come out of the some of these erroneous teachings mm -hmm. you know and I think it's very important that we renounce those erroneous teachings just because somebody I love taught me something and it was wrong you know even though I love you but you taught me wrong I need to know and learn how to renounce that. I don't have to continue yeah. to carry that along. I didn't think we'd have enough to talk about with this question, but oh, we did. Yes. We talk um, about sex, I have, a lot to I talk have about. one <laughs> last question. I have time for one answer. I'm gonna oh, come great. to you, Amy. This lady writes, I like control. I've been reading in the Bible how I'm supposed to surrender control to God. How am I supposed to do that? Well, I am a control freak. I like to have control of the home. I would like to control my, I would love to control my kids. That would just be the best if I could just <laughs> control them and then control the church and just control everything. Like everything would be so great. But the problem is I don't have control mm -hmm. of anything but myself. And when I read the scriptures mm -hmm. and I'm looking up scriptures about, I'm a control freak, what do I do? It talks a lot about self-control. So I might not be able to control everything else like I want to, but I can control me. And I can do the old cliche, let go and let God. And that's hard that's right, yes. when you want to have control because you do know what's best in some certain situations. Right. And you have to let right. it go. And the truth mm -hmm. is control and letting go of control is a decision that you're going to make. It's your choice. And I looked up something for you to see. It's step three in recovery, Christian recovery. And it says, we made the decision to turn our wills and our lives over to the care of God. So as Amy's talking about she wants control, she can also make the decision to allow God yeah. to take it. Let God and let go. I'm going to let go right now. We'll see you in a minute to close this up. We are beyond grateful that you have chosen to share some time with us. We know that you could look at any station, any program that you desire to, but for whatever reason, you chose us and we're grateful. So we dare not leave you 
with any gaps in between. And for that reason, we have a scripture we'd like to share with you. And it's out of Hosea 12 and 6. So you, by the help of your God, return, observe mercy and justice, and wait on your God continually. You know, we talked a lot about circumstances and situations, and the key thing really is the return to God. There are so many things, you have so many voices in your ear. You have perhaps your friends' voices in your ear, spiritual leaders' voices in your ear. You have society's voice in your ear. You have, you have your job's voice, your doctor's voice. But what about the voice of God? What does God really say to you about a lot of these things that we're talking about? Our children that have been, been put on loan to us from God. Our sexual desires and how do we steward that part of us? There is so much that God has blessed us with and yet he left us with a manual to know how to steward it. So I want to encourage you from this point, any question that you heard today and any answer that you receive, dig deeper in the word, spend time with God, and let him be the one that manifests the change in your life. And you know what I loved? Flo said, you chose us, and I say, and God chose you. We're so grateful. And we also say, as iron sharpens iron, so does the countenance of a man or a woman, or for me, a sister, sharpen the other. See you next time. We are Sister to Sister.